Okay, good morning. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about me and my job first. Right now, I am the Director of Behavioral Division in the Department of Family Medicine at Eastern Virginia. And my job includes oversight of all sorts of behavioral interns, including psychologists, social workers, and other allied health professionals. The major part of my job is training residents and medical students. And something like 15% um, of the family medicine residency program is psychosocial or behavioral. And heaven knows we need it. I think our patients are so complicated, and our doctors are on the front line for everything psychosocial. As you know, you probably use your doctors a lot. So we're seeing, uh, you know, we're dealing with a lot of that. I get to teach the third-year medical students when they rotate through one afternoon of substance abuse, and that's about all they get in that third year. So, you know, your doctors need you to talk to them, believe me. So be, feel free to tell them what they need to know about our patients. I don't know about you all. Part of my job to earn my keep is seeing patients, and I've been a therapist for 20 years and love it. But I think our patients that we're seeing now are so much more complicated than they've ever been before. Don't, what do you all mm -hmm. think? It seems like so, social issues, psychological, the combination, the co-occurring is just worse than it's ever been. So um, anyway, that's a little bit about what I do because I'll be talking a lot about what we see and what we do as we go along. In order to make this a little more interesting, I really am counting on you, too, to feel free to comment and add uh, questions or thoughts on these topics because the first one of these trainings that I went to was very dry and the guy put up slides it was last year and he had all these slides and then he said oh I had slides but I can't have anything on them because the book isn't out yet so we had blank slides the whole day and I said no this is not good at least you'll have something to look at okay um, I'd like to know a little bit about you how many of you are in private practice how about um, substance abuse Okay, any doctors in the room? Okay, oh gosh, okay. Alrighty, and uh, let me see, what else? Inpatient? Okay, I have worked with, I do a lot of supervision for substance abuse and clinical social work licenses, and so I get a lot of stories about what's going on, and I think every one of us are on the front line for things that are pretty scary these days. And, uh, but anyway, so without further ado, um, what we want to talk about today is get a little bit better understanding of the history of the DSM and how it's evolved and what DSM-5 is supposed to mean for us. Uh, we want to understand how it relates to the psychological presentation of clients because as you all know, we have to know the DSM in order to get paid, right? And I teach psychopathology to graduate medical uh, social work students and I am this semester and you know, it's that fine line you're walking between embracing the person as the whole person and having to diagnose them and give them something you can get paid for, right? And sometimes that gets to be interesting. Uh, we want to look at how to use the biopsychosocial assessment better when it involves what it's going to want to mean for an accurate diagnosis. And I'm sure all of you have experienced the case where you get a patient, they're diagnosed with something, and you look at their chart and you meet them and you go, what, right? And you don't know where that diagnosis came from. So assessment, of course, is an ongoing process. And we're going to go through the major changes in DSM-5. I'm not sure which ones will be of interest to you, so I'm counting on you to add to it, to question it, to talk about it, and make this more interesting, okay? Um, and then we want to look at um, the specifiers. The one thing, one thing I will say about this new book, how many of you all are using DSM-5 now? Okay, not everybody yet. If, you've, if you're familiar with the book and you started looking at it, you're probably with me in the fact that you really have to open it and read it, don't you? It's, to me, it's much more complicated, and there's an awful lot of specifiers. And I know I have two interns right now. One is doing an online program from Boston University. One of them is doing a, a, is at Norfolk State. And it's very interesting to me the difference in the impact of the way they are learning truly on the way they're going to coming to practice. Both of them are very good, very mature, and very smart. But I get to staff cases with them all the time, and so we're in this book. But I'm like, oh, my gosh. I mean, every time I look at it, it seems to be more to learn in here and more to read. So my first thing I want to say is get your book in your hand and open it and read it, okay, because that's important. Um, the second thing is, what did I do with them? Where did I put books? Oh. Uh, this little handy-dandy pocket guide. It's not a bad thing to look at if you, it, you all, none of you all are new, but I always get my students to look at it because it talks about lots of basic concepts. And then, of course, we all have the little pocket guide that we can carry everywhere we go in case we need it, right, when you're diagnosing friends and neighbors and family. <laughs> 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 a 
We go out to dinner these days with my friends, and I'm always saying, okay, tell me what's ailing you today. Let's get it over with, right? So then we can talk about life. Okay. Anyway, so we want to learn how to talk a little bit about how to use the book better. The other thing I want to suggest to you is another book that um, DSM, as you know, is simply a diagnostic manual. It doesn't talk about treatment. But the other book that we like to use is, the, is this book by Kaplan and Sadek, Concise Textbook of Psychiatry. The real one is like three volumes, yay big, for psychiatric training. This one is um, a smaller version. They just came out with the DSM-5 version, which is thicker, and I left in the clinic and forgot to bring, so this is the older one. But I love this because it takes you a step further, and it recommends treatment. It talks about, for each disorder, what kind of medication, what kind of therapy works, works best. It's a really handy-dandy accent piece to have around uh, to use when you're not sure about things. It's Kaplan and Sadek's um, Concise Textbook of Psychiatry, and you feel free to look at it when you get a chance, okay? All right, so whoops, with all that said, uh, let's talk a little bit about the DSM. First of all, I want to say, how many high-paid psychiatrists sitting in some cold conference room did it take to come up with the fact that we're going from Roman numeral 1, 2, 3, and 4 to the number 5? That's the first change, okay? We're no longer Roman numerals. We're going to the number 5. Uh, but right now, back in 1952, which is really not that long ago, folks, um, it was a purely psychosocial uh, perspective for the first time putting it in print and calling it something. In 1968, they came around to conforming to the World Health Organization's classifications of diseases, but the book was, you know, criticized still, as it still is, for being unscientific. In 1980, or until the DSM-3 came along, the psychological approach prevailed, and it was then that the DSM-3 diagnosis began to be required for treatment, which turned our world around, because that's when we had to start giving people something in quick, in quick order. 1987, the 3R came along and used some field trials, but again, it was considered um, not exactly accurate and, and there was a lot of potential for misuse. Yes, sir? My mother is uh, deceased, but she was an RN. Uh -huh. And when she was in school, they gave her a little manual of psychiatric terminology. Uh -huh. A lot of it, I, I don't even know what they mean, but they have <laughs> the name of the illness and the, di and the definition. Uh -huh. That's all that they had. That's all they had. Right, and it wasn't used officially either. It was, no. yeah, right. So we have come a long way with this. Um, 1994, we came into DSM-4, uh, which began to add the cultural information, which is, I think is so important. And it was based on more field trials. 500 field trials, for those of you that ever read research articles, you know that 500 field trials really isn't a whole lot when you look at it. But the important part of this one is that it added the PI system, the person and environment. And they began to look at the um, multi-axial system, okay? Which, to me, I've always thought that was a beautiful way to paint a really nice picture of a patient at a given moment in time when you're doing that assessment, right? Uh, I really think the person and environment aspect is what really makes our work so important and certainly moves us above the doctors. I'm always amazed how my doctors don't have a clue about so many things about the patients when they, after they are talking about them. Anyway, so it was changed to reflect psychosocial and environmental problems, which I think is an enormously important addition, uh, particularly given the world today. And it continued the descriptive approach, of course, and includes information on uh, research and more field trials, which is all about science. Okay, so, and as DSM-5 comes along, we're moving into and away from descriptive into a little more scientific based, and I will talk more about that when we get to the substance abuse disorders. So basically, let's go back a little bit. If we're going to use this book to diagnose patients, and how long do you have to come up with a diagnosis on an intake? An hour, right? And so in an hour, we're supposed to figure all this out and put, give somebody, tell somebody what they're doing, right? Sometimes it's easy, sometimes it's like peeling an onion and it takes a while, right? Um, so psychopathology is the study of mental health disorders. Their problems, their causes, and their processes. And we must not forget that that's what we are about, is the study of psychopathology. We're not looking at just a book of labels. Uh, it's impairments, deviances, and distresses, but they're not always pathological. So, you know, and that's one thing I find with my doctors a lot, and you'll find with the physicians you work with, is that 
they tend to think that I've got this patient that's depressed. Okay, well, they're depressed. Are they depressed today? Or are they depressed for a long time? Or how bad is it? But they don't go there. They, don't, they miss the point that you can be starved, broke, or lonely and distressed, but that's not a pathological diagnosis, right? And so we want to be real careful about that. Um, you can be a drag queen, a punker, or a crook. And that's pathological, but it's not necessarily psychopathology. It depends. It depends on a lot of things, right? Um, mental health disorders must be clinically significant in order to uh, be a, di a true diagnosis, and you can or may not, may or may not have biological changes. So I think that's one of the things that we have to think about in doing the assessment. I love it when I'm reading students, new intakes or process recordings, those dread things, and they'll say, uh, they have these now these 20 page intakes that some of the agencies have. Any of you all doing that kind of work where you have a big intake? And they'll say, okay, what brings you in today? And the person says, you know, oh, my husband left, my car broke down, my kids are sick, you know, I, I don't, I can't do this, that, and the other thing, and my life is falling apart. And they'll say, oh, okay, how old are you? Okay, with no reflection at all of what that person just said to them. So we have to say, oh, really? So at least give them something like, wow, that sounds really bad, right? So, uh, or that really sounds difficult. And that's the other thing about the doctors, that we try and teach them to slow down and say, give them something, give them a little bit, really? You know? Or do you ever feel like you want to fall out of your chair and you say, you did what? <laughs> you know? But anyway, um, so the specific diagnostic criteria are guidelines for making a diagnosis. Um, it's been demonstrated that what it does is it enhances agreement among us. It gives us a way to talk to each other, right? If I tell you I've got a borderline patient, you, have, you know a little bit about what that patient's going to be like, correct? So that's mainly the idea here. Um, so DSM-5, number five, classifies mental disorders, not individuals with uh, disorders, but the disorder themselves. Uh, each mental disorder is classified, again, as clinically significant. And remember that every mental health disorder is a syndrome of signs and symptoms that come together in a, in a consistent manner. So if you think about that, signs um, are those things that you can see. You can see tears, you can see shaking, you can see tremors, you know, you can see somebody's sad affect, uh, but you have to depend on them for the other rest of the symptoms. They have to tell you how sad they are. Using, you know, use your one to 10 scale, how bad is it today? I do ever sit down with patients and they tell you all these awful things and, and then I'll say, well, how bad is it today on a scale of one to 10? And they'll say, oh, I'm a seven. And I'm ready to shoot myself listening to them, but they are doing okay because that's their worldview and their coping skill. So we want to remember that these disorders are a constellation of signs and symptoms that come together in a somewhat predictable pattern, but not the same pattern for everybody. So that's why, you know, your assessment is so important in driving this train here. So if we look for a minute um, kind of at the art and practice of case formulation, which is kind of a flavor of the day floating around, um, when somebody comes in and you say, what brings you in today, and you start your assessment process, the assessment and that front load of information is your biggest driver of the rest of that train. Is it not? It's going to be the guide criteria that start your engagement with that patient, whether it's for one session or for a long, a long engagement of therapeutic care. But it's the assessment. And if you don't do enough on the assessment process, you're going to miss the, wrong, the diagnosis. And you're going to go down to the problem list, which comes next. And we're all about motivational interviewing, which is really t tickled me when I was, went back to the medical school that they're all about motivational interviewing. Well, have we not been doing that since 1802 in the behavioral world? But now we all have to learn it again. But anyway, it's the assessment that's so important and how you do a thorough assessment and look at every aspect of that patient care that's going to drive that diagnosis and hopefully we're going to be on a little better path. Then you get your problem list. What's the patient's concept of their problems and what are yours? Real often in our world, we see things like you need to take your medicine. Well, you do too, I'm sure. You need to take your medicine. You need to go to therapy. You need to come, right? Uh, you need to do this or that. And when their problem is, I don't know what I'm having for dinner tonight, so how am I going to get here? Transportation is an enormous barrier in our world, right? Um, juggling how and when you're going to get there and that sort of thing. Another problem we're seeing is juggling getting people in to see a psychiatrist. Now, I understand you all have a lot of those in this area, right? No? We just have oh, really? Well, we, I think I was calling around this week that the soonest I could get somebody in an hour area upstairs in my building 
is April, and it's about two months everywhere else. So we, and every time I see the medical students, I always say, how many of y'all want to do psychiatry? And I think in the last year, it was maybe one or two, in the last two years, okay? So I'm like trying to rev them up on that one. But anyway, so going back to this, the whole idea here is that we've got to do a better job of assessing and slow down a little bit, and you've got to open your book and really look at all these things with the um, specifiers in particular. How many, those of you that are using DSM-5, what do you think about that? Are you looking at all the ins and outs of the conditions of each disorder? Have you noticed that, anybody? Any, who's using DSM-5? Yes, what do you think? Mm -hmm. But, um, yeah, I've noticed that there are qualifiers as well. Lots of qualifiers. Yes, lots and lots of qualifiers. Okay, anyway, enough of that. Whoops. Yeah, am I going backwards? No. Okay. The purpose of the, of the manual, then, is to provide a clear description of diagnostic categories so that we can communicate about these things. It's if you, don't, you can't put a name to it, mm -hmm. you really can't talk about it and give it a treatment. You know, us calling somebody, giving somebody major depression is really no different than somebody that has thyroid problems and the doctors are treating that. So, you know, there's a, there was a lot of debate about, you know, it's, we don't need DSM-4, we need to look, you know, blah, blah, blah. But actually, we do need it as a road map. Would, would, don't you all think it's a good road map for us on a way of qualifying what we do? If you have a name for something, it makes it a lot easier to work with. So you can treat it better, and you can talk about it and, and coll collaborate better. Whoops. Um, it's used by all kinds of healthcare professionals and disciplines, and it's certainly the thing about insurance reimbursement. Uh, that's a game that we all have to play, right? I was so excited. Recently I had a patient that needed uh, to go into substance abuse treatment for opiate addiction, which is our, what, number one problem in the mm -hmm. country. And he had Blue Cross Blue Shield, and I was all excited about this. Yes, we can get him somewhere. Guess what? Blue Cross Blue Shield doesn't pay for opiate detox. So couldn't, didn't, couldn't get him very far at all. So we have to play that game all the time, right? But anyway, um, so, and again, it attempts to describe the man manifestations of what that mental disorder looks like with clinical features. And that's kind of what this book does. Um, that's why I like this other little book I mentioned because it takes us a step further also, and there are lots of others out there. Okay, so it's descriptive. The new one is descriptive rather than psychological, and it's a basis for, it gives us a basis for a diagnosis. Uh, clearly delineated objective and readily ver verifiable criteria, hopefully getting more scientifically verified as time goes on. Uh, again, this is what we're talking about here. The person with the same disorder does not have to have the same clinical characteristics. We have choices. And that's why going back to your assessment, it's so important to be able to see those things. In my past life, I worked for lawyers for a long time. My last lawyer was a medical malpractice lawyer. So I can tell you what it's like to sit in an office with a bunch of paralegals combing through medical records looking for disconnects. They're looking for disconnects. Mal we had some excellent malpractice cases. And my doctor had represented my lawyer had represented doctors for 25 years and then had gone to plaintiff's work, but he knew a good malpractice case. And he was brilliant. He was fascinating. And we would have doctors from all over the country fly in to testify about things. But the point is you have to make things connect. If it's not listed in your assessment what the symptoms and signs are and for that diagnosis, you're looking at trouble, okay? Because then if you go into treatment, and something goes wrong, you've got to be able to document and, and talk about it, why it ca you did what you did with the plan. Does that make sense? And so I think that's hugely important that we remember that just because it's like the mood disorder thing, just because somebody is depressed, how does that play out and what does that look like? And so that's why I think we have to really open this book and really work with it to get us so that we're talking the same talk. Okay, the DSM does not prescribe treatment, as you know. So we have to look around for constantly be studying and reading about evidence-based best practice. Pra flavor of the day, evidence-based best practice versus practice-based evidence. What do you think? That's another interesting topic, right? Um, it's kind of like the thing about full moon make people crazy. Research swears and declares that it does not. All of us that work in the field know darn well that on a full moon we're in trouble, right? So, so that would be practice-based evidence for sure. Uh, anyway, okay. The multi-axial system. In 1994, 
they adopted it and it recognized environmental problems. Again, which I think that today in particular um, is very important. You know, in our world, we talk all the time, why is it that in our clinic there's so much anxiety and depression? Do you think you're seeing a lot of anxiety and depression? Um, why now? So we talk about why are things so much worse? What are the environmental factors here that we're considering? Well, you know, certainly the economy has something to do with it. <coughs> Excuse me, job, job insecurity. If you lose a job, you lose your insurance, those kind of things. What do you think about the media? Does the media hype us up? Hey, there's rain coming tonight. I didn't know if we were going to get here this morning or not. Listening to Don Slater last night. It's coming, okay? <laughs> Ebola is coming. Everything is coming at us live and in person, block by block. And I think it's making people very anxious. But to, when I talk to the young people, the medical students or the PA, the PA students, and I'll say, what do you think is driving all this anxiety? What do you think they say? Facebook, social media, absolutely. It's amazing. They immediately say social media. One of the residents was sitting in the clinic one day, and he said, Dr. Ole, I'm on technology mm -hmm. overload. And I said, what do you mean? And he said, I'm sitting here seeing 11 patients with electronic medical record. I've got patient portals, that wonderful thing that we can now see our medical records and freak out, right? Um, he said, I've got tasks coming in, which is how we talk to each other in-house. I've got messages from the front desk. And he said, and I'm going home tonight to do my notes because I'm not going to have time to finish them today. And he said, you know, you, the compulsiveness of the Facebook, the email, you know, the email, the, the tweet, the Instagram is just getting really so fast-paced and so uh, important. But I think we have to look at the context that our people live in. We're telling obese people to go for a walk and they're saying, I can't because I might get shot. And that's a reality, right? So, I mean, I think we're living in a world that's creating a great deal of anxiety. So we have to look at that and consider that when we're looking at diagnosis. You know the five axes. I don't have to preach to this audience about that. Um, the global assessment of functioning was always interesting, wasn't it? In, in, path, in psychopathology class, I'd give them cases and we'd come up with GAF scores and they range always from 80 to 35 for the same case. You know, you just never knew, right? So I'm, that one going away is not so bad. But the bad news is, we're doing away with it. Now, th there are people that will argue about that, that they think they're glad that it, we're going away with it. What DSM-5 is doing is moving us to the medical model, and now we're going to have a list of diagnostic numbers for billing purposes. And just like our doctors do on, the medic on your medical chart, there's a whole list of diagnosis and billing codes. And that's what we're going to do with DSM-5. Axis 3, which is your medical conditions, has been con combined with 1 and 2 and will be included in a problem list. Remember, I told you we talk about a problem list, and so we're going back to just simply a list of numbers and conditions. Axis 4 and 5 have been dropped completely. The GAF score is, go is gone. We no longer have that. Whoops, wait a minute, one more time. And Axis 4, of course, the psychosocial environmental issues are going to have to be included in your narrative, don't you think? Well, but, we don't, but they're so important, and I hate it that we're not pulling it out. Because I just think really looking at a 5 axis, to me at least, was a wonderful way to see a... a a picture of a patient at a given moment in time. What do you all think? Right? So I think we, can, we can't use it anymore, but I think we still have to certainly consider. Yes, ma'am. <coughs> Actually, you are not allowed to use it anymore. No, ma'am. I think so, too. I know, I think so too, but no, we can't, we won't be listing it. You know how now you list the five axes when you give a diagnosis? That's gone. No more. Yes, ma'am. Well, I, I believe the reason for that is because when you are doing biopsychosocial, and you're speaking with this person, you're basically finding out what their purpose is. And then from there you move on to, okay, so let's talk about your family, your history. Okay, where are you today? That's already in there. So, I mean, you already have that access spot. You have that information. You're writing it down. That's true. And you have to, but you have to be sure it's included in your narrative for the next person picking up that chart to understand. You know, so I think that's important. But from a, as a, from a clinician standpoint, I mean, I always thought it was a pretty neat way to organize your patients' information, don't you think? Anyway, so that's one of your major changes. No more five-axis diagnosis. No more GAF score to worry about. So the order of the book, it's arranged by the category of mental disorders. The order is entirely different now. If you remember in DSM-4, you had your childhood and infant and childhood disorders first. Um, they've taken away from that. Um, They've done away with that chapter completely, and they've included them in other chapters. And actually, if you think about it, a lot of those diagnoses of infancy and childhood 
you know, belonged in other areas too, so it would, that part's not so bad, I guess. But you, there again, you've got to open your book and, and learn to understand it. The specifiers, we've already sort of talked about that. There's a lot of qualifiers in this book, and you really have to pull it out and read each section to look at it um, to see what that's like. So we'll start a little bit with the anxiety disorders. Whoops. And we'll kind of go through these one by one and we'll, as we go through the disorders to see um, how they play, play out, how the differences play out. So please feel free to add to this and talk about it. Uh, way back in the beginning, before this came out, there was some talk that they were going to do away with generalized anxiety disorder. And I know the people upstairs in psychiatry and, and myself and everybody I talked to was like, no, please don't take away generalized anxiety disorder. That's my number one diagnosis, I think, <laughs> these days, right? Don't do away with that one, for heaven's sakes. Anyway, um, uh, pa panic disorder and agoraphobia are now two separate disorders. Remember before it was panic disorder with a specifier with or without agoraphobia. So now we've done away with that and they're two separate disorders. And that's not so bad. The generalized specifier of social anxiety disorder, which used to be called social phobia, is changed in favor of a performance only like a specifier of public speaking and so forth. Um, so again, you've got to look at the specifiers and how to write all this out. So um, that's another change. Separation anxiety uh, disorder and selective mutism are now classified as anxiety disorders prior, other than being early onset like they were in DSM-4. Does that make sense? They're still there, they're just in a different place. So the arrangement of the book is different. If you, um, you have to explore that part of it too. So that's pretty much the anxiety disorders. Um, any questions or comments about that? Do you, how do you feel about agoraphobia being a separate disorder? Yeah, I think so too. I never, I don't have trouble with that one. Right, makes sense? Mm -hmm. Do you see a lot of it? Yeah, I think one of the, one of the hardest rule outs we're seeing in our clinic right now is um, a mood disorder I mean, I'm sorry, are an anxiety disorder, and they're overlaid on top of each other. You know, anxiety is a symptom of depression in some way, but I think we're seeing a lot of one and the other on top of each other, sort of, and it's getting, that's probably one of the more complicated things we're seeing, I think. Anyway, ADHD, a big favorite in our clinic because everybody wants Adderall and Ritalin, right? Good stuff. Let's go get some. Uh, the same 18 symptoms are being used as in dsm 4 and they're still divided into the two domains of inattention and hyperactivity, um, in which six symptoms in one domain are required. Uh, anybody, I know some folks here are with school systems. Are you seeing a lot of ADHD? Yes, a whole lot, 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 lot. We're seeing a lot of adults coming in. And you know, because we are a residency training clinic and because we are doctors and they think they can dupe doctors, we're walking a fine line on this adult ADHD between who's a drug seeker and who's not. Do you know what I mean? And we've got doctors that are over here and don't want to give anybody anything, and then others over here that'll give them anything they want, you know? So um, we have to really be careful on, on this one, particularly right now, because it's hot stuff on the street. But anyway, that's pretty much um, this, 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 you know, that kind of thing. The cross-situational requirements have been strengthened to several symptoms in each setting. You know, to, and we keep, I keep saying to the doctors, don't go, jumping on ADHD until you get that three-pronged evaluation, the primary care doctor, the teacher, and the um, uh, parent. Is that what you all are doing in the schools, looking at the three-prong? Yes? Okay. Anyway, so it, that's still to be looked at. Um, it's been changed from symptoms that cause impairment before age seven to several inattentive or hyperactive impulsive symptoms before age 12. So they've increased the age the age on that from 7 to 12. What do you all think? You? So, a comorbid diagnosis with autism spectrum is now allowed. It was not before. Anybody want to comment on that? Anybody work with autism? Okay. And then, of course, um, the threshold change has been made for adults uh, to, re to reflect um, of the ADHD of five symptoms instead of six. You know, the adult ADHD screening tool is so simple. Anybody that does it can have ADHD if you know, what, if you know how to write, answer the questions correctly. You know what I mean? So you really go in back. You really have to get a good history here um, because we are, really, we are really run scared on the medication front these days. There's so much interaction in t of medicines anyway. 
But anyhow, that's kind of ADHD. Anybody want to add to that? Yes, sir. Depending on that, if it's slowing it, <coughs> are they looking at the nutritional possible causes of ADHD? You're reading, they're reading a lot about that these days, yeah. Of course, you know, we're all worried about diet. And, you know, they, I went to a lecture just recently on obesity and the, the, the eating habits and all that's contributing to that. That's an epi, it's considered an epidemic in this country right now. So certainly they're looking at that. Then there's the thing coming out about gluten. Is it gluten contributing? How do you all feel about that? Anybody on, into the gluten thing? What's that? We give up one more thing. We might as well start. <laughs> I, it's day by day, isn't it? Eggs are good, eggs are bad. Milk is good, milk is bad. Okay. Anyway, that's kind of the ADHD thing. Just remember now that we've changed the age for the adults. Uh, excuse me. And... um. The, uh, the year, the, the age change, okay? So, um, autism spectrum disorder, the new DSM-5 name reflects the previous categories of those four things that are now on a spectrum, okay? Which puts us back to reading the book about how you, how you put it, what way on the spectrum. You really have to understand what they mean when they look at this. Anybody diagnosing, nobody's diagnosing autism spectrum disorders? Yes, what, what do you think about this? A better description? Good. Not so, it's not so confining, is it? Yeah, yeah, good. And that's the big difference here is that, uh, you know, you have one name for the, what was the four disorders before. Uh, so, okay, it's still characterized by de deficits in communication and social interaction and restricted repetitive behaviors, interest, and activities. My daughter has three children. We had three under three, which has really been interesting. Um, and she called it one day. She goes, I think he has... ADHD, and she, I said, why? I said, give it up. I think he's, I think she's two, it's okay, you know. <laughs> and then she'll call me and she'll say, oh, I think he's got autism, he's just so focused, and I'm like, give it up. Can stay off the internet, stay off the internet, yes. <laughs> yes. And a lot of times, depression. A lot of these kids are really different. We see, in a, we see a lot of dysthymic disorder from some of these family situations. Just that low grade, life is not good, I don't feel right. Do you know what I mean? That, it's just amazing. But I think you're absolutely right. And I think the other side of it is that we, we try and be real careful about it, the doctors try and be real careful about, is that a lot of what looks like hyperactivity is lack of parenting. Would you all agree with that? going back to being careful about diagnosing. One of my psychology, psychologist friends in Virginia Beach said he went to Catholic school, nuns had rulers, we stayed in our seat. <laughs> you know. But I do think it's a, that's where we go back to, a lot of combination of environmental factors. Don't you all agree? More so, more complicated than ever. I can't get over how people live these days. I mean, I must be getting old, but it's just, I keep thinking I'm not gonna fall in my chair. But I just can't not get over the lack of respect for elders or family members or for each other, the amount of abuse that we're dealing with, that kind of thing. I really do think it's alarming. What do you all, am I, am I seeing a, we, you know, a different segment of the population? Anyway, okay, specific learning disorder uh, combines the DSM-4 diagnosis of all those things, reading, mathematics, written expression, and so forth, that we used to see into one uh, called a specific learning disorder. Whoops. And I guess anybody with the school systems, you all work with the specific learning disorders a lot? Some? Okay. And probably you all will see them. The rest of us don't do much with this. Would you agree? Um, that's another thing about the book. Whatever it is that you're doing the most of, that's what you're going to have to focus on studying, right? Um, four refinements to oppositional defiant disorder. That's another popular one, isn't it? The symptoms are now grouped into three types, angry and irritable, Argumentative and defiant behavior and vindictiveness, uh, oppositional defiant disorder. And again, going back to what you said, sir, don't you think a lot of times we're looking at kids that are depressed or, or feel uh, impaired in some way? Um, yeah, I think that must be one of the things about the social media thing. Uh -huh. I think you can understand that. I think it's a lot of things. I think that you do for the enemy many, many decades ago. Called what? Yeah. Uh huh. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Uh huh. Yes. Do 
you know, it's interesting you say that because back in, do you remember when Columbine happened a, yes. however long ago? I went to a talk not long after that by a guy who was a psychologist who had been called into Columbine as an expert at that time. And he said, and back then all we had was email. We didn't have all this other stuff, right? And he said, you know, he said, these kids sit home alone in rooms by themselves. Nobody watches family TV. Everybody's got a computer or a TV in their room. And they, they don't, and they're missing the social interaction. He said, it's very easy to kill that which you don't know. Right? And I think that's a huge issue for us right now. And you're right about the isolation. And no matter how many friends you have, you know, it's like everybody on Facebook looks better, acts better, the pictures are greater and grander, they're doing wonderful things, you know, and you're feeling like chopped liver, right? You know, so it's a lot of pressure, a lot of pressure. I want to post a script on that today on this afternoon on Science Friday. I heard a little bit over there. I have a segment on when you're bored and you don't know what to do with your time and all of a sudden you pick up your iPod or whatever. Instead of doing that, allow yourself to daydream. Yes, yeah, so I saw an article on that daydreaming thing, and you know, meditation all of a sudden is getting a, a big push because people need relaxing time. We have no downtime at all. Yes. You know, this is a big issue I teach, and I teach in college, and I, I tell them, you know, of course, I want to constantly be connected, and I tell them, you know, the problems about you need to learn to self-soothe, but I teach another issue that I teach in the board in school, which I was. I look back the window. Right. You know, and I tell them, well, if you imagine to do this, and they look at me like, imagine, what do you mean? <laughs> like, really? And I think that we have to get our kids out of the mode of, you know, watching these TVs, getting on these, you know, and playing with each other, interacting, because it's making us lazy. Well, that's another thing. We sit home. And somebody said the other day, in the old days, you have to get off the sofa and go change the channel. <laughs> we don't even do that anymore. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, the other aspect too is texting. Uh -huh. You know, um, it's, you know I, I talk with a lot of the children and I let them know, you know, texting is not a correct form of communication. You have to have that face-to-face -face contact or that telephone contact. One, because sometimes what's being communicated comes across the wrong way. Yes. The oh, other yes. thing also is you're not really building your communicational skills. Also, the writing skills are horrible. Horrible, horrible. I'm grading papers and it's like, oh my gosh. I know. Verb tense and, you know, it's just really, anyway. Enough of that. We Okay, enough of that. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, let's see. <coughs> All right, so the exclusion criteria for conduct order has been, dis has been removed and oppositional, def oh, back up. You understand what that means? The okay. And then given that many behaviors of oppositional defined disorder occur normally in developing children, and they do, do they not? Um, in adolescents, a note has been added that provide guidance on the frequency of the acting out that's needed. So it's not just my little granddaughter being two and, and throwing a fit on the floor, okay? Um, she's not hyperactive, she's two and it's okay, you know what I mean? So anyway, um, a severity rating has been added this time to the criteria showing the degree of pervasiveness of the symptoms. So there again, pull your book out, read the specifiers um, of symptoms across settings. It's an important indicator. So again, look at your book. If, you, if you're working with children, how many of you work with children? Oh gosh, a lot of folks, okay. All right, um, let's see. Schizophrenia, two changes for schizophrenia. Um, they eliminated the uh, special attribution of bizarre delusions and first rank auditory hallucinations, that of two voices talking to each other. Uh, in DSM-5, two criterion A symptoms are required for a diagnosis of schizophrenia. Remember, in one time you had to have bizarre delusions or some, for some reason or another, so they've kind of done away with that. Uh, the second change is the addition to criteria A that the individual must have at least one of those three symptoms, delusions, hallucinations, or disorganized speech. 
uh, which is not a bad, you know, that's pretty much standard, right? Okay, anybody work with schizo patients with schizophrenia? Okay, yes. Um, subtypes have been done away with, have been eliminated due to their uh, difficulty in diagnosing. How do, how do you all feel about that? Those, it's not, that's not a problem, is it? I'm kind of glad about that one. Paranoia certainly what you could recognize pretty easily, but the rest of it kind of all ran together. What do you think? Yes. Um, people, how many of you all work inpatient? Okay, yeah, good. Uh, you know, it was interesting. I have to share this story real quick, too. Um, one of my supervisees works at one of the best agencies I've seen in a long time for the, for the chronic and persistently mentally ill in North Carolina. He, um, they had a day program. They have a psychiatrist on board. They have outpatient therapists there. I mean, everything you would want for these folks. A case manager, I mean, community support team, I think they're called, that go out in the community and do things. Wonderful program like we don't see much of anymore. And uh, before Christmas, one of his patients came in, and uh, he's a supervisor, so his office is not arranged in a way that's patient-friendly, okay? So this guy comes in, and he's agitated, and he's off of his medication. And so he's acting out, and he's a big guy. He's 6'2", and he weighs over 300 pounds, okay? So he's a big guy. So anyway, on Wednesday morning, he comes back in, he comes in when my guy goes to work, uh, the office, the posters are off the wall, torn up, shredded in the middle of the floor. Everything is in disarray, and things are thrown around, and the only guy there is this fellow. And so he looks around, and he goes, looks at the guy, and he goes, what happened here? And the guy goes off. And, he's, and so, not realizing it, my guy went on in his office. The patient goes off and starts screaming and ranting and raving and cursing and comes in and, and accusing my guy of accusing him of something he didn't do. I mean, you know how they do, okay? and proceeds to throw everything off the desk at my guy, pushes everything across the desk, and picks up the computer and wants to throw it at him. So meanwhile, somebody walked by and heard all this and called the police, which is what they do there. And so my guy, knowing how to do this, said to the guy calmly, uh, you're right, I really did do all these awful things you're saying, and I apologize, and I, we're going we're gonna to talk about that. Put the computer down, and let's talk about it. Let me check on a patient outside here, and I'll be right back, and we're going to talk. So he let the guy leave his office, thank goodness, because he was in one of those situations where he's behind the desk and the man is over here. Meanwhile, the police come. Meanwhile, the gentleman gets the scissors in his hand. And so when the police come, he goes after the police officer with the scissors. And so they taser him, and the taser doesn't work. And so the guy keeps coming with the scissors, and so they shoot him. Okay. Now, it was amazing to me. We hear it all. We hear a lot about this these days. The guy's okay. He lived. He's not okay. He got shot in the gut, but he he lived. But the the point of the matter is, it brings home to me is that we have to take our work very seriously. Okay. We really do. And it was a real wake up call. I went back and I told my doctors about it. I told the clinic about it because our offices are not arranged that they are between the door and the patient either. And I think we have to remember that we're working with fragile people and that fragile people are dangerous. When they are off their medicine, and, and he said, this guy's like a tank in there. Do you know what I mean? And the reality of it is, I think the police get a lot of bad raps in these cases. But are you all familiar with the rule of 21, and this is definitely an aside, the rule of 21, that somebody with a knife or a scissors can cross 21 feet and stab you before you can shoot them? Okay, and that's why when you hear police officers shoot some of our folks, that it's not that they're standing there shooting them 10 or 11 times and that they didn't try to taser them first. It's that these people are big and strong and dangerous, and so are some of our drug addicts. Do you not agree? And I think the biggest concern we have in the clinic with people going off is people that want drugs and they deny them drugs. And they get, they really do act out. But just a little, share that story that it really was a, a wake-up call to me, not that I don't think about it all the time, but just to hear it that close to home, it can happen to us. Do you know what I mean? So anyway, be cautious because people are in our care for a reason. And of course, schizophrenia is one of our most serious illnesses that we deal with. Anyway, all right, so schizoaffective disorder. Uh, the requirement now is that a major mood episode be present for the majority of the disorder's duration um, after criteria A has been met. Okay, remember it used to be you had a mood disorder uh, in the absence of what it, what was it, how does it go? And remember, schizoaffective disorder is kind of the mirror image of mood disorder with psychotic features, and that's a fine line in diagnosing too, you know what I mean? Is it a mood disorder with psychotic features, or is it 
Let's get so effective because this is a very serious diagnosis and a hard, difficult disorder. Would you agree? So again, if you're working with folks like this, <coughs> check out your book and look at the things. Bipolar disorder, um, criteria A for manic and hypomanic episodes now have an emphasis on change in activity and energy, which is certainly something that we see in a manic mode. Do you not agree with that one? So that's okay. Um, bipolar one mixed requ um, requiring that they simultaneously mix, I mean, meet the criteria for both major depression and mania has been removed and a new specifier with mixed features is used, which makes a lot more sense too, don't you think? Mixed features has been added. Anybody work with folks with bipolar? Another very serious disorder to pay attention to, right? Um, new depressive disorders. The first one, um, back up, disruptive mood dysregulation disorder. You probably heard about this one. It was designed to help address con concerns about too much diagnosis of bipolar in children. You know, we had a, we kept, we were seeing a real run on that one for a while with the bipolar in children. Um, so the overtreatment of bipolar. So now it's included for children up to 18 years of age who exhibit persistent irritability and frequent episodes of extreme behavioral syndrome. So we're not now calling them bipolar. We can, we're using this new disruptive mood dysregulation disorder. What do you think? I kind of like that one, don't you think? Um, this one too is interesting. Premenstrual dysphoric disorder has been moved from DSM-4 things to study to an actual diagnosis. Hello psychiatrist men who were sitting in a cold room figuring this out, right? Um, if you remember, I don't know if you remember, and I can't remember the name of it, but many, several years ago, Prozac was running out of its yeah. license or whatever you call it. And so they came up with a two-week dose pack, and it's not Primpro, that's something else. Seraphim. What? Seraphim, yes. Pink and, it, and purple. Pink and, <laughs> pink and purple, okay. And it was for our PMS, right? So now we have a name and a diagnosis we can give, and we can give that medication comfortably, right? Um, we can get more money for it. We can get more money. Pink and purple instead of cream and green. Oh, okay. The drug companies are really smart about things like that. They are. Thank you. What's it called? Ser Seraphim. Seraphim. F-E-M. That's right. Seraphim. That's right. Anyway, so, um, but now we have a real disorder called PMS. I actually have a client who clearly, clearly has this to the point of clinical significance that's really, really bad. And she's working with a uh, GYN doctor on it too. But I mean, I think it is a very real thing that certainly in doing your assessment, um, you, know, you need to know this. Dysthymia now falls under the category of persistent depressive disorder. We no longer have dysthymia. And that makes me kind of sad. I kind of like that diagnosis too. I see, we see a lot of that. But I think now it's called persistent depressive disorder, which includes chronic major depression and the previous dysthymic disorder. So what do you think about that one? Remember now we're into PDD, okay? Persistent major. We see a lot of that too in our, cl in our clinic. We really do. Do you all? Yeah, it's a lot of dysthymia. Where are you? Private practice. Private practice, okay. Alrighty. Um, let's see, what else? Any comments on that one? Any of the depressive disorders? Like them? Okay. Um, bereavement exclusion. Um, in DSM-4, there was an exclusion criteria for a major depressive episode lasting more than two months following the death of a loved one. And the exclusion is omitted in DSM-5 because really you don't, you don't recover in two months. It's not like there's a time limit on recovering from the loss of a loved one, right? When that, you know, it can go on for a very long time. Um, the depressive symptoms associated with bereavement-related depression respond to the same treatment as regular depression does, and so we've done away with the bereavement exclusion. Okay, yes, sir? Yeah, I, I have a problem. Okay. Because I, I think there is a danger in pathologizing purely everything. Yes, you're right, I would agree. It's a normal reaction to human grief. Right. I don't know necessarily that grief has to be medicated. Sometimes yes, sometimes right, no. Right, exactly. But I think I'd rather look at the interpersonal situations, the person that religious beliefs, yes. community, right. that, uh, or not, or family, a social network of real human beings right. who provide company <coughs> support, or rituals that they can use to help them work through. Right, support um, groups, support groups. Yes, yeah. exactly. So uh, I, I guess it saddens me to see where you can pathologize. We have, um, 
I doctor to stay at the clinic at Westminster Canterbury Retirement Center down in Virginia Beach, and I go down there and do a support group for caregivers who have um, loved ones who are transitioning into either health care or the Alzheimer's unit. The interesting thing is in my group, everybody in my group has been married more than 60 years right now. Isn't that amazing? It's a real different kind of population in that retirement center there, but, but they are lovely people. But, and I do consults for the doctors in the clinic. And they sent me this lady. She was 90-something. She had been mar married for 72 years and had lost her husband a little over a year before, okay? And so they sent her to me because they thought she was depressed and they were trying to decide whether or not to medicate her, okay? So the lady came to me and in doing the assessment, she said, I'm not depressed. She said, I'm sad. I am really miss my husband. He was my partner for 70 years. She said, I really miss my partner, but I'm not sad. And she was certainly not depressed. She was going to Zumba. She was swimming every day. She was going to dinner with friends every night. She said, I do everything I normally do. She said, but that doesn't mean I'm not sad and I don't miss my husband. And I think that's the point you're making, right? And so, you know, I said, no, this lady, I'm, thank goodness I didn't have to bill for it because what would you call that? Adjustment disorder, perhaps, chronic. But even at that, she didn't even have that because she was doing fine. You know what I mean? Yes. It actually legitimizes grieving rather than It does because it, it says that it's okay to feel sad more than two months. Right. I, I, that's, that's the good part about it, yes. But anyway, so I think you're, that's, that's not a bad thing, okay? All right, obsessive, compulsive, and related disorders. Um, and we're going to get a break in about two minutes, okay? Um, OCD and new, uh, and new DSM-5 re re reflects new evidence that they are related to one another. And they include things like hoarding, um, like skin picking, and like substance in, uh, medication induced obsessive, compulsive, and related disorders. So I think this is not a, a bad thing either that um, they are related to one another. Hoarding is another thing. They sent me this 90-year-old lady and they said, we think she's a hoarder. Can you talk to her? Okay, some of these people are hoarders. And it's dangerous when you might fall over the trash that's stored in your small apartment, okay? Or large apartment either. So I talked to this lady and she said, look, she said, I moved from a big home to a, an apartment here. I moved from an apartment here to an efficiency here. I moved from an efficiency here to enhanced services, one room. She said, I've gotten rid of everything. My son helped me clean out my papers and books that I love. And she said, all I have left is a few collections. So we went up to her apartment, and that's all that she had. And it was nothing about hoarding. She had several cases of a collection of lighthouses from everywhere she'd ever traveled, a collection of something that her children had given her over the years. That's not hoarding. That's all she had left. Do you know what I mean? But I think the hoarding, there is a hoarding disorder, and it's obsessive, and it's a compulsive behavior. And I think we have to recognize that. But they are all combined now. So what do you think about that one? Okay? That's not bad, right? All right. Um, dissociative disorders, real quickly. Uh, have anybody working with dissociative disorders? Where are you, anyway? Private practice. Oh, <laughs> okay. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, Derealization is included in the name and symptom structure of what used to be called depersonalization disorder and is now called depersonalization derealization disorder. So that's not so bad. A dissociative fugue is now a specifier rather than a disorder itself. And I think that's all on that one. Nope. Uh, dissociative identity disorder. A lot of debate about that one going on out there in the literature these days. But it's been changed to indicate that Symptoms of disruption of identity um, can be reported by the person as well as observed, and that the gaps in recall events can occur for every day and not just for traumatic events. Does that make sense to you if you work with them? I haven't really worked with the idea, but I've read it. a wonderful book called The Associated Identity Disorder. It's called the Clark of Sarah Krakauer. Okay. It's a local person, which is a way to it. And it's for me that it's really questioning whether it's a separate entity as opposed to symptoms. There's a lot of literature out there questioning whether or not it's a separate entity or a collection of symptoms. You're right. And we'll talk about that with PTSD, too, in a minute. Okay. All right, let's take a break. I think you have some refreshments somewhere around here, and we'll be back in about five or eight minutes or so. Okay? Thank you. Okay, moving right along here. Are we doing all right? You're not bored and asleep yet, are you? Okay. All right. Uh, somatic symptoms. Oh, excuse me, I had never, I was never familiar with somatic symptoms until I went to work at the medical school, and I am amazed at how much somaticism we see, somatization we see, um, a lot of it out there. 
in DSM-4, there was a lot of overlap in the disorders and a lack of clarity. And any of you ever try and diagnose any of these disorders? If you remember, somatoform had so many criteria. I mean, it was like six symptoms and six body functions. I mean, it was just an amazing list of things. And what is amazing to me is that a lot of our patients have it, okay? Uh, so, so it's very real. But anyhow, there was a lot of overlap. Um, the disorders are, were pri are primarily seen in medical settings, and um, it, the diagnosis were often problematic for the rest of us, and that's very true. The doctors really do deal with a lot of this stuff. Um, there's all kinds of numbers about primary care that something like 75% of the people that go to the doctor don't have a real mental medical problem. It's, it's driven by something psychosocial. And our doctors would agree with you totally on that, primary care doctors. Um, and so think about it for yourself too because what people present with first, and we get people first a lot of times because they go with their headaches and their stomach aches and their the symptoms of anxiety and everything else, and the doctors miss a lot because they don't ask enough of the like questions. So we're pushing that big circle assessment back on them to front load, and, we, and when the medical students come through, they do standardized patient scenarios, and every one of the cases that we give them, they're given feedback by a doctor and one of the behavioralists, and every one of them has a psychological or psychosocial overlay, domestic violence, teen pregnancy, something like that. So they have to learn how, if they don't do a good assessment, they miss the problem and they miss the real diagnosis and they don't get credit for it. So I think we're doing, a, EVMS does a very good job on that with standardized patients. But anyway, okay, so they are mainly seen in medical settings. Um, there's something like 70% of people with somatoform disorder benefit from an antidepressant medication. And that's another thing I want to say to you all. There's on the website, there's a, if you Google 100 psych, top psychotropic medications, there's a chart that you can get from something called the Clinician's Toolbox, and it will give you a list of two different lists. One is generic name, trade name, dose range, and what it's used for, and off-label. And you can get one list is generic name, trade name, one list is trade name, generic name, like citalopram and Celexa, that kind of thing. But what you'll find is a lot of times people, primary care doctors who treat a lot of anxiety and depression underdose, and they'll start somebody on, say, Selexa 10 milligrams and leave it on them forever and think they fixed them, okay? When in fact, you know, the dose range is 20 to 40 and the patient's probably going to need more, you know, in a couple of months, and they count on you as a clinician to really work with them on that. But print that, look at that, 100 top psychotropic medications, and the 2014 list is out and all the names and information's on there. Good tool. Yes, ma'am. Question? Could you say that again? Would you Google? 100 psychotropic medications, and it's from the, and there's several things will pop up. One of them is from NAMI, which gives them to you by category, but the other one is from, I think it's called the Clinician's Toolbox, some kind of toolbox. And there's two lists, one by generic name, one by trade name. And I keep that in my desk all the time. When I say to a patient, are you on medication? And they tell me what. First thing I do is pull out my list to see how their dose fits what they need for that disorder, okay? Yeah, there's all kinds of books that you can get too. But this is a real good cheat sheet. I like cheat sheets. Fast and dirty, okay? All right, anyway. So um, DSM-5 reduces the number of the disorders and subcategories to avoid a lot of this confusion. And um, so all these things, pain disorder, hypochondria, uh, undifferentiated somatoform have been removed, and now we have somatization disorder and related disorders. So it's a lot easier to look at. Again, you have to go back to your book if you do this and look at specifiers and um, things like that, okay? A lot of unexplained medical symptoms though, okay? One of my favorite stories is a little eight-year-old kid comes in the clinic, has headaches and stomach aches all the time. His mother brings him in and says, you know, how are things at home? Fine. His daddy's an airline pilot. His mother's a stay-at-home mom. Everything's fine, but he's having headaches and stomach aches and missing a lot of school. So one day the grandmother brings him in and says, and the doctor says, well, how are things at home? And she said, they're terrible. His mother's an alcoholic. When his father leaves on her flight, his mother drinks. And when she drinks, she gets, takes her clothes off and passes out somewhere in the house. And the eight-year-old has to take care of her, put the dog out, get himself to bed, get up in the morning and find, make sure she's still alive and get himself ready to go to school. And then you wonder why he has headaches and stomach aches. So that's the kind of thing we're looking at here, okay? Anyway, but that, uh, anyway, uh, and they couldn't find anything wrong with him after multiple tests. But anyway, that's kind of what the somatic disorders look like. Remember, a lot of these folks have depression and antidepressants really help. 
We're really pushing big these days on not pushing benzodiazepines and Xanax and Valium. SSRI antidepressants are the frontline treatment for anxiety and any of those kind of things, so try and remember that. Your doctors need your input on these things, believe me. Um, so now they meet the criteria for somatic symptom disorder, but only if they have the maladaptive thoughts, feelings, and behaviors in addition to the symptoms, okay? So that said, hy hypochondria uh, has been eliminated, like we said. Um, and they have other things in relation to high health anxiety. Patient portal, reading your medical records, and the internet are creating an enormous amount of health anxiety, right? Yeah. Please stay off the internet. <laughs> <laughs> Please don't read your latest CAT scan and panic about what it says because you probably don't understand it. The worst things happen to us is people that read the medical records. Okay, anyway, it's, there's both way, two ways to that story, but there's a lot of anxiety around it. Um, with high health anxiety, you get an illness anxiety disorder diagnosis unless it's better explained by some other anxiety disorder. Like I said, we're full of anxiety these days, so go for it. Um, anorexia uh, is pretty much unchanged except the requirement for amenorrhea, which is the lack of periods. And I think this is so funny. That requirement was waived in men to begin with. Now, isn't that, who, how many psychiatrists <laughs> sitting in that cold room did it take to figure that out, right? Um, but anyway, and for females taking contraceptives. But that's one change that has come up. So, hello. Um, bulimia, the only change is the reduction in the required minimum average frequency of binge eating um, from twice to once a week. So, I don't know how you, who works with, anybody work with eating disorders? What do you think about that one? Yeah, I know, it's interesting. Uh, binge eating disorder. The only significance from the preliminary was that the average frequency of binge eating required has been changed from twice weekly for six months to once weekly for three months, which is identical to the DSM-5 for bulimia. So, hello. Eating disorder. Eating disorders is a very... Now, before it was eating disorder in our labs. Yeah. So you like this? Yeah, binge eating disorder, yes, yes. There's a lot of that, and that goes right along with anxiety, seriously. All right, um, let's talk about addiction. Now, how many of you all work specific, uh, specifically in substance abuse? Everybody works with substance abuse. It's everywhere, right? Um, this is an interesting point. Up until 2014, the American Society of Addiction Medicine described addiction as a primary chronic pervasive um, progressive disease characterized by increased denial and treatable by abstinence and re-education. And that, how many of you all know that definition well? Right, that's what we went by, right? Okay, it is a brain disease. And if anybody wants to, to argue about that today, you need to read some literature because I think it's so impressive. What neurobiology is finding out about addiction is marvelous these days. Any of you all go to the Virginia Summer Institute School here in Williamsburg? If you haven't been, I don't care what level of practice you're in, you need to go. They have wonderful training, but they have some doctors recently that have been coming in talking about the neurobiology of addiction, talking about the compulsive behaviors. They can study brain chemistry that describes every bit of all of that, the, right down to the behaviors. So it's very interesting. They are finding things out about addiction now that are changing the way we treat as we sit here. It's those findings that are driving the medications, Campril, Every, uh, antabuse has been around for a long time, but things like Campbell, Suboxone are coming out of neurobiological research, and it's very exciting right now in this field, I think. Very exciting what they're finding. But that's the old definition. Now, the new definition from ASAM, as of August of 2011, I'm sorry, is a primary chronic disease of brain reward, motivation, memory, and related circuitry. Wow, what does that say? That's talking science, isn't it? Dysfunction in these circuits lead to characteristic biological, psychological, social, and spiritual manifestations. Got spiritual in there now. Um, this is a reflection reflected in an individual pathologically pursuing reward and or relief by substance use and other behaviors. That's, that's, the change in these definitions to me is a huge reflection of what DSM, where DSM-5 is moving in the, to the medical model, as someone mentioned at the break, and of where we're going in this whole field that we work in now into knowing so much more about what, what's driving the behaviors 
and the presentation of our clients. What do you all think? It's an exciting time. If you're young in the field, go read articles. Read literature. I know it's the worst thing you want to hear, but it's really so exciting what's going on. At that. Yes, sir? Well, one of the things, I've worked in addiction since the beginning of my career, and, um, you know, one of the things that's really great about it, someone comes to me with parents with schizophrenia, there's just so much we can do about that. Addiction, we can really treat. And oh, I love really it. Uber get better, and that's right. I agree. offer people real hope. Yeah, I agree. I think working with substance, people say, why do you like substance abuse? They, you know, they always relapse, and they're such losers. And I'm like, no, they're not. They're people like you and I. And underneath that, if you peel that onion and take away that addiction and start working on real stuff, it's a beautiful process. And I've got some folks that I work with that I just am so enthralled with what they do with their AA and the 12-step work. And the other thing is, I teach those things to everybody. I mean, one day at a time. Keep it simple. The serenity prayer. Amen. Brother, that solves a lot of problems right there. Those AA. AA whoever that was, those two guys back in 1935 that started AA were quite wise, were they not? But you could do a whole talk on AA sayings. Play the tape to the end. One, you know, that kind of thing. And I love the one about drive looking through the windshield, not the rearview mirror. Right? Right? Anyway, so this, this is kind of where we are, folks, with these de de definitions. Um, okay, now, so we've got this new definition, which we just went through, I think, right? Yes. Okay, uh, no, more. This is more. Addiction is characterized by an inability to consistently abstain. Impairment in behavioral control. Craving is diminished and so forth. Oh, you can read all that stuff. Um, it's cycles of relapse and remission, as we well know, right? I think it's one of the most predictable patterns of anything in the DSM, don't you all? when the way it plays out and the way it presents. Um, and without treatment or engagement in recovery, it's progressive and can and does end in death. And gosh knows we're seeing so much of that right now. The mixing and matching of medication is horrible. It really is. But anyway, so now we've gone away, as you know, to substance-related and addictive disorders. That's our new category. Um, it combines substance abuse and dependence. We can no longer talk about those things, right? Uh, into a single disorder measured on a continuum of mild to severe. Now here again, you've really got to get into your specifiers and read your book on how this plays out. And you've also got to go back. You've got to front load with a good assessment because we're counting numbers of criteria to qualify the specifiers. So one to two, three to five, five to seven, whatever it is, you've got to darn well know, okay? So we're back to this continuum. Um, each Oops, okay. Each specific substance, other than caffeine, um, is addressed as a separate use disorder. And that's really not that much different. Alcohol use, uh, you know, the different drugs that are listed in DSM. But nearly all substances are diagnosed based on the same overarching criteria. Now, I want to show you something. For those of you that don't have the opportunity, and I don't know where it is in the book, but I'm going to try and find it real quick. There's a chart in your DSM, if I can find it. Um, which I probably can't write this minute. It's a chart. Here it is. Okay. On page 482 in the DSM-5, it's a, one of the best charts you ever want to have, and I never knew it was there until I started teaching psychopathology, okay? But it lists the drugs down the one side, and across the top it gives you every other disorder that is mimicked by that substance use. So when you look at alcohol-induced whatever or something, here's your chart, okay? If you've never taken the time, which I had never done before either, to really look at this book, this is a fantastic chart. It's on page 482, and it's diagnosis associated with each substance abuse class. It's a real eye-opener when you look at that, folks, okay? So I think that's a nice little addition there. Um, so anyway, uh, so we want to talk about each specific substance as a separate use disorder and uh, diagnosis of substance abuse previously required only one symptom. Do you remember there was always a lot of gray area with substance abuse, was it not? It was almost like nobody really ever fit that category, <laughs> you know what I mean? So, um, but um, DSM-5 requires two to three symptoms from that list of 11. You need to look in the book and look at the list of 11 because it's very important that we understand the number of those criteria that are needed for the severity specifiers, okay? Um, Drug craving has been added to the list. Thank goodness, that's not new, is it? You know, um, and problems with law enforcement has been taken away. Now, that one I'm not real happy about because I often thought that legal problems were a really good turning point for people. What did you all think? And I really hate it that they've taken it away as a specifier. Yes, ma'am. What I found is that 
I see with my clients, I can already young people, and if it's not illegal, it's not a problem. Right, exactly. I Right, exactly. That's true. And alcohol is one of our worst drugs as far as problems go, and it's legal. So that may have something to do with it, too. I don't know. But, um, you know, it's... Included in the narrative, so... That's right. That's exactly right. And, you know, it's funny. We try and tell the doctors and people that if you ask your patients, and that goes for us, too, about use of alcohol and or other drugs, because alcohol is a drug, and we need to remind them of that sometimes. But um, you have to be specific and ask about each category. And is there anything else? Because like spice and bath salts, I mean, we've got to keep up with what's hot on the street, too. And again, in our clinic, we're front line for everything weird. Um, and you, this lady's from Nags Head, and I will say, I used to work for our mom mental health, and we were down there. Nags Head gets it first. Whatever's hot and new, it goes to the beach first. Bipolar people love the beach because when you go on vacation, you don't have to take your medicine. Isn't that right? They have the weirdest <laughs> crisis calls down there you ever want to hear. Isn't that right? <laughs> Truly. Um, but anyway, um, back to the marijuana thing. You have to ask about each drug. And when you say to young people, particularly these days, do you ever use any drugs? And they'll say, no, no, well, how often you smoke in pot? Every day, right? You know, and it's just amazing to me. And it's amazing to me the quantity and the mixing and matching that's going on. So we really have to be very particular when you're doing. And I'll tell you another thing. Aetna Insurance came into our clinic a year ago and did a chart review from all the behavioralists, you know, psychiatry and psychology and all of us, looking to see that on every intake, nine, nine, what is that number, 98701 or whatever that intake number is, that everyone had a substance abuse history freestanding. And if we didn't have it, we were dinged. So keep that in mind when you write up your initial assessment. Make sure that you do a separate section for substance abuse and put down there, every category or something like, you know, talk about their drinking and then say client denied use of any other drugs. But you better have it in there because insurance companies are now looking for it. I thought that was interesting too, right? But anyway, um, okay, so we've done it. We've added craving, which is a good thing. We've done away with law enforcement, which may or may not be an issue. But if you look at an assessment as being a detective and looking for signs and symptoms, I still think we have to include legal problems in our list. And I I'd also think, if you remember back when the DWI law was written, kind of around the idea of um, the whole continuum of substance abuse. Because if it was your first DUI, your blood alcohol was under 0.15 or under 0.14, whatever it was, and you didn't have a problem with living from it based on the assessment, it was called abuse, and you went to ADETs, remember? But if your blood alcohol was over some level, if you had more than one which showed compulsive use in spite of problems, if you refused it, for, which is just plain silly, or if you did something, what was the other thing? I can't remember, but it really reflected nicely what we're looking at with the continuum, right? Okay, so anyway, substance-related addictive disorder, again, the, de the concept of dependence caused a lot of confusion in the past. If you think about it, any medicine that you take legitimately creates tolerance independence of sort, okay? So it caused some confusion. And they always talk about dependence and addiction, when in fact dependence is normal, a normal body response. And when we talk about addiction, as all of you in this room know, we're looking at a behavioral syndrome, are we not? Which really sets it apart. Uh, DSM-5 does not include caffeine use disorder, but good heavens knows we got to ask about that one, don't we? When we're talking about anxiety, if you've got somebody with anxiety, we're gonna ask them how much coffee they drink or how much, hey, what is it, Red Bull, oh my gosh. And all those things, right? Uh, but it shows that um, as little as two to three cups of coffee can trigger, with, trigger withdrawal. When I teach substance abuse classes, I always make my students give something up for six weeks, and they have to journal every day, and they have to talk about it. And all of a sudden, they realize that on every corner, there's a Starbucks, okay? Or that everywhere you go, there's sweet iced tea. Or, and then they always binge the night before it's time to start, and they drink all these sodas, and then they go into And then the first week of class, they're all agitated with headaches, you know? So anyway, we all know that, right? Um, a concern for the continuum is how to level the use of the criteria for treatment options. When DSM-5 was first being talked about, there was a lot of anxiety in the substance abuse world about how are we going to diagnose this and be at fairly accurate in what we're getting out of that diagnosis, right? But I think if you really look at the 11 criteria and you really do a thorough assessment, understand your patient, um, it really makes a lot of sense on the numbers of symptoms and what they're talking about from the severity standpoint. What do you think? Who is the pa oh the patients oh well yeah given that certainly that's right that's right I only drink two beers all right uh, yes ma'am.
at the criteria and the numbers of criteria. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But, but there's, that's not much different from abuse and dependence, though, if you look at it. You know what I mean? Because abuse indicated continued use in spite of a problem, right? So what we now know, and what's driving this more to this medical model, is that it's a, it's a brain disorder, and brain circuitry is changing, okay? And the key to the whole thing about addiction to me is continued use in spite of problems anyway. Right, and you keep on going. But what we have to figure into this is 500 things that come together for a diagnosis. It's like somebody can be depressed, but they're depressed 50 ways. Okay, we can also be addicted. You know, what are the 500 things for each individual that comes together to create that? And I still think we're looking at a continuum, don't you all, of use and how it progress? I still a progression at least, don't you think? I think the issue, and I, I don't want to take up a lot of time. The issue I run into is in, in educating and teaching there are folks that can be involved in some pretty serious substance abuse who may or may not be able to manage uh, social goods. Right. Whereas the addicted can make them over will. Right. And, and I feel like that continuum doesn't make that as clear. Doesn't. Where, where does it fit in the continuum? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, in the end, yeah. I don't have no one Well, I guess the whole idea here, too, is it's a substance use disorder. If it's causing you problems, then it is a problem, right? And it can be, if it's a mild problem, it's a mild problem. If it's a major problem, it's a major problem. Um, but again, that, that's one of the concerns in this whole thing. Yeah, well, I think, I know, I think, I, I, I agree. The whole thing always did that with the abuse thing. Okay, so the threshold of the number of criteria that, mu that must be met has been changed. The severity is based on the number of criteria. As we said, we got to know those. Criteria for cannabis and caffeine withdrawal were added. That's pretty interesting. This is the first time that DSM has added caffeine I mean, and cannabis withdrawal. And, and they're finding out who, who, ned, who never thought that, ca that marijuana users had withdrawal. People would tell us that all the time, wouldn't they? Yeah, so now it's in the book. Now we can say it for sure. And, and caffeine there, and everybody knows about caffeine withdrawal. I mean, that's pretty common too, right? Who's drinking coffee this morning, okay? Um, new specifiers were added. Now here again, we're back to specifiers. Remember your remission specifiers, please, because if you're painting a picture of a client in a problem list, to me, the fact that somebody was, co well, in the old days, cocaine dependent or something dependent, and they're in full remission, that tells more of a story. These, the specifiers are used to tell the story, right? So go back to this. Um, new specifiers in a controlled environment and on maintenance therapy. You know, maintenance therapies, methadone, and other such things. And that's not anything new or exciting. I mean, that, that makes sense, does it not? The controlled environment, of course, is prison or wherever like that. Okay. Um, gambling disorder. Who asked me about gambling at the break? Somebody? Yes. Process disorders. Process disorders. A lot, it's interesting that video games, internet addiction is under study. Now, that's one. Why did they sit in that cold room and decide not to include those when, they, to me, they're such a problem right now, right? And I will tell you, I'm a game addict. I mean, you know, I'm the one that picks up my phone and wants to play Angry Birds everywhere I go when I'm waiting for something, right? Um, do I continue to use it in spite of problems? Yes, it gives me neck aches and headaches, and I waste a lot of time, but I still do it, right? So, I mean, if we put it in, con in context. But, but gambling is the first one, um, the increasing inconsistent evidence that some behaviors activate the brain reward system. And they're telling us that all of these things do, all of these things do. It changes your, your brain chemistry. The other thing that they're finding is that things like marijuana, things like uh, alcohol when you quit, it, uh, marijuana in particular, it takes the brain up to three years for the memory to return to pre-using normal. And see, the other thing that's interesting to me, and I know you all find this, is that with addiction, we're seeing a lot of people that are 35 years old have been using drugs since they were 12. They, that more, they went through developmental ages, years with using mind-altering chemicals. 
So we're looking at people who are 35 that act like they're 12, legitimately so, right? right. The other thing that we're seeing um, that is so much fun to talk about, I think, is the baby boomers. Um, you know, and I've got five or six folks on my caseload right now, they're in their 50s, that started smoking pot back in the 70s, you know, and we're loving it, and, that's, and, they, and they say, well, it's just kind of what we do, you know, it's what we do. You know, or I did it for years and I quit, and it's what well, I'm doing it again, you know. Um, but, it's, and, but the thing about it, too, is that they don't consider is that the drugs are so much stronger now, and we're seeing a lot more, like, heroin overdose, and everything's stronger, okay? Yes, ma'am. Are they looking for the link of, I mean, you, you say it takes three years to redeem the memories, and thinking, well, the memories were altered people who were smoking the drugs. Right. Were but there's such a rise in the dementia at an earlier age. You know, yes. Yeah. Are they looking for that sort of link? Yeah, because, you know, alcohol is a real contributor to that, too. And, of course, as your metabolism changes as you get older, it makes a big difference. Um, yeah, so the, that's another issue. And that's the other problem for the baby boomers is they go out and they do this stuff that they did when they were 20, and now they are 50, 5 or 60, and, you know, you just can't do the same thing. What is it they say? Three beers at 60 is equal to 12 at 20 or something like that. Oh, that's a real eye-opener. They, they put a bar. What's that? What did you say? Uh, they put a... Oh, yeah, yeah. They put a new bar in Westminster Canterbury a couple of years ago, and there was all this concern that the bar was going to be a problem and that people were going to all hang out in the bar and get drunk. Well, the reality is the ones that were drinking were drinking in their apartments. The bar has never been a problem, okay? <laughs> so, you know, it's not, about, <laughs> it's not about that. Anyway, okay, so gambling has been added. It, it's gonna, we're going to see a lot more of this coming along. And the word is that DSM-5 will have a revision sooner than later. And I think some of these things will be part of it, don't you? Um, okay, so anything else about addiction that you all, are there compulsive disorders that you want to say, add? Oh, how are we we're just using the new um, substance-related disorders, okay? It's interesting. We're definitely going to the medical model, and that's kind of what we're looking at, being driven by all of these things. Okay, major and minor neurocognitive disorders. Uh, dementia and amnestic disorder are now named major neurocognitive disorders. So one thing that I think we have to remember going back to the assessment process is the rule-outs. You know, and before you can give anybody anything else, we've got to rule out medical, and DSM still says that, rule out your medical conditions and medicine effects, and then rule out substance abuse. And that is so important that we get that primary disorder of substance abuse uh, considered early, early on. Do you know what I mean? And that's another thing that the doctors miss. They real often, and you know why they miss it? They miss a lot of PTSD, they miss a lot of anxiety, panic attacks, and they miss a lot of substance abuse. And do you know why? They don't ask the right questions. They don't take the time. So we're pounding into their heads. You've got to ask about substance abuse because it's a primary problem, and you've got to rule out medical, medicine, and substance abuse first. Yes, ma'am? You also have to depend on the patient being honest. Yes, you do, and they're not, and we know that, right? And we try and convince them of that. But if you don't ask, you don't know any, you don't have a clue. That's right, you know? So anyway, they, um, uh, that's important. And then your next criteria would be your cognitive disorders and then your psychotic disorders, and then your mood disorders, and then your anxiety, and then you go on down the list to everything else, right? But you've got to do your rule outs in order to come up with the right diagnosis. I worked with a psychiatrist one time, and I thought I was being so clever and creative early on, coming up with these really wonderful, appropriate diagnoses. He didn't care. Every patient he saw was 296.32, major depression, recurrent, moderate, because he could prescribe medicine, and that's all that mattered. You know. So anyway, but that's not our responsibility. And as somebody pointed out at the break, too, um, we have a license on the line in a lot of cases, and we have a responsibility to our patients, bottom line. And if you're in an agency these days, and the mental health world is kind of crazy out there, no pun intended, and I think some of these agencies are pushing people to work at a production rate that is really not in the best interest of our patients. Would you all agree? Yeah. And I'm telling my students and my supervisees all the time, in, in North Carolina went through an enormous, horrible upheaval in the mental health system, and they are really under the gun down there about being pushed to do more with less. If you're being pushed to the point of unethical practice, you need to think about where you're working. You know, I really, and it's getting more and more serious about that. Yes, sir? When I, I'm retired this past year, but when I had residents and interns, I gave them three sessions to do an intake. Oh, really? Uh-huh. To Lauren, that's right. That's, that's good. Yeah. And so I didn't even tell them, uh, I, I trained to not even begin to do a treatment plan until after the third session. Wow. 
Wow, good for you. Uh huh. Well, it does. It takes time to get to know folks, you know. And, and again, you're not going to get the real truth till way later on with your substance abuse. Where were you? Oh, that's a wonderful agency. Yeah, good. Okay. Alrighty. So anyway, uh, let's see, we talked about this a little bit. Um, oh, they now res recognize, this is interesting, a less severe level of cognitive impairment called mild neurocognitive disorder, um, which uh, permits a diagnosis of less disabling syndromes that may still be the focus of attention. And that may have something to do with all the Alzheimer's kind of thing that we think we see, okay? Um, Oh, okay, back up. Anyway, that's pretty much the overview of the major changes. What do you think? Anything you want to add or, ch or change? Okay, we have another 10 minutes if you'd like. I have a little Jeopardy game I put together that might be a quick review if you'd like to do that, okay? You all ready? We won't worry about buzzers and time limits and dividing the room in half and all that business, but let's see, see what you think about this, okay? So we're going to play Jeopardy. Whoops. <laughs> now, the problem with this is if it's going to work, okay? We don't ever know. But there's our categories, okay? Substance use, more about substances, geriatrics, way with the future here. We're getting to be an older population. We've got to pay attention to geriatrics, mood disorders, and schizophrenia, and more, okay? Who wants to go and pick a category? Go. Who wants to go? Yes, ma'am. Substance abuse, substance abuse for And I forgot how to do this. Wait a minute. i got to do this over here. I'm sorry. Okay, substance abuse for 100. Where, well, maybe? Okay, cut down. Annoyed, guilty, or an eye opener? Who said that? What is, remember? What is cage? Yes, ma'am. Okay, very good. Moving right along here. Okay, we'll pick a category. Um, okay, I'll do 200. 200. Okay, substance use 200. Then he's cracking free base. Anybody else? Stimulus. Stimulus, okay, anybody else? Okay, let's see. Amphetamines, right, stimulants, uh -huh. okay? We could spend all day learning hot ticket names for drugs on the street, right? Okay, let's see. Okay, you wanna pick a, who's it? Sorry, you said stimulants, you wanna pick a category? Okay. Wait a minute, what happened here? Hold on, that's not, that's not right. Wait a minute. See, I told you it doesn't always work, okay? Uh, how about 400? Okay, the leading, the leading preventable cause of mortality. This is a weird one. Uh, anybody want to take a... <laughs> Abstinence. Let's see.
substance abuse 500, okay? The number of days metabolites of opiates and opioids can be detected on a urine drug screen after the last use. Important for us, three days. three days. Okay, 72 hours, three days, all right? Three to four days, exactly right. This is something else that we need to know in these days, too, is how these things work. Do uh, you want to pick another one? Oops. Okay. Schizophrenia 100. Okay. Aphasia, flat affect, and social isolation. Symptoms. What kind? Remember, we're looking for signs and symptoms. Negative. Okay. What are negative symptoms? Negative symptoms are the lack of something. Flat affect, social isolation. Okay. Positive symptoms are hallucinations, illusions, things that are there that don't need to be there, okay? Um, okay, pick a category, whoever said that. Who said that? But you did. Uh, geriatrics 100. A behavior of an elderly person that threatens his or her own safety and accounts for 75% of elders who are mistreated. This is a weird one too. In fact, we'll just give you the answer because it's kind of self-neglect. Self-neglect. Yeah. Um, that's kind of something to think about. If you're working with an older adult, that's certainly important. Okay, another category? You want to pick another one? <coughs> 200 schizophrenia and more. Intrusive, troublesome thoughts or impulses and repetitive rituals enacted to reduce anxiety created by obsessions. Compulsions. Yes. Thank you. What, what are compulsions? Exactly. OCD. Or what is OCD, right? Uh, okay, what else? Pick a category. Um, geriatrics 200. This is the most comprehensive list of medications to be avoided in the elderly. I didn't know this either. My geriatric doctor added these when we were doing this. Uh, it's a list of medications, and you might want to make note of this. It's called the Beers List. And among the things that I mentioned that you might want to pull out for your little handy dandy desk toolbox, the Beers List is a nice list of medications that uh, should be avoided by the elderly. And again, that's a doctor thing more than us, but it doesn't hurt to know it. Okay, you want to pick a category? Somebody? Anybody? Okay. Did we just do that? Oh, gosh. Okay, we just did that. All right, let's see. 300. Inattention, disorganized thinking, acute onset, and fluctuating consciousness. What is late afternoon at work? <laughs> Okay, this one is neat. Now, this should be easy for you guys. Now, that is what is delirium. What's, what's the difference in delirium and dementia? Short. Acute onset, slow onset. Like duration. Acute is short duration, dementia is long duration. Okay? Nice way to think about it, right? Oh, work, according to this. <laughs> That's right. Okay, let's see. What else? Pick a category. Sir, go ahead. I like your work hands, so pick a category. You. Oh, uh, more about substances for 500. Oh, wow, you're big time. <laughs> substance use disorders and substance induced disorders. Yes, thank you. Who said that? Yeah, there you go. What are the two groups of substance related disorders? That's right, use and induced. Okay. All right, pick a category. More about substances. The most misused prescription drug. Okay, all the above actually. Oxycontin is the most used, but the same thing, all those categories, that's right. No, you want to pick another category, ma'am? Um, mood disorder 300. 300. Chronic low grade sadness, irritability, negative thinking, low self esteem, and low energy. Symptoms of what? Depression. Depression. How about low grade sadness, irritability, dysnomia, which we no longer have, so now it's persistent depressive disorder. <laughs> okay? Persistent for a second. Whoops, wait a minute. Oh, wait, back up. Whoops, whoops, sorry. Back up. 
Oh, okay. History of numerous hypomanic and depressive episodes. Intensity does not warrant diagnosis of major depression, not due to any established organic factors. I don't know where we are on this. Let me see. Cyclothymia, exactly. That's another one that we think we see a lot of. That it's easy to get confused with dysthymia and with people. And you find too that people with depression that get on medicine all of a sudden feel better and think they're manic. You know, people that don't understand what any of this means, it really takes some education. Okay, let's we'll see real quickly here since we're running out of time. Want to pick another one? You said that you did. We already did that one. Yeah, we did. Okay. Okay, next, go ahead, 500, okay. A neurotransmitter linked to suicide. What is serotonin? Okay, yep, you got it. Something else to know more about. We're going into science here, remember. Okay, pick one. Okay, a more about synthesis for 300. Oh, okay. Time it takes half of a drug to leave the body. Okay. What is half life? Absolutely. Something else we have to explain to our clients. You want to pick one? Okay. Memory loss, dementia, depression, social withdrawal, plaques and tangles. Okay. Old age. Work. What is Alzheimer's? Thank you. Yes. What is Alzheimer's? Exactly. Okay. All righty, go ahead, pick one. Okay, geriatrics, 500. Okay. Those born between 46 what and 60. All right, thank you. <laughs> know them, please. You're going to need to know them. Oh, that's right. Pick another, pick another one. Okay, uh, more about substances, 400. Okay. A new non-substance related behavioral addiction. It's the new DSM. Gambling, yes, absolutely. <laughs> That's another one that needs to be in there, okay? <laughs> Pornography. In, in, I, mean, I, can't, I have a lot of clients that get in a lot of trouble with that kind of stuff. And they marry them when they met them online, talking to women all night, then they wonder why they're on the internet all night. <laughs> okay, what else? Let's do, are we only? Bickering, explosive violence, and honeymoon phase. Bickering, explosive violence, and honeymoon phase. <laughs> well. Three stages of abuse, exactly. That's right. Okay. Yes. Okay. Next, sir. Oh, we don't need Yeah. This group as a whole engages in frequent suicidal acting out. It's advisable to treat them with medications that have been found to have a low degree of toxicity because they often will threaten overdose. Thank you. What are borderlines? How many people have borderlines on your caseloads? Oh, yes. Okay. Alrighty. And the last but not least. And I'm not sure what this does. Let me see. Final Jeopardy. 75% of murders occur during this time of domestic violence. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Oops. When is the spouse leaving? Absolutely right. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's been a great deal of fun. Thanks for your input.